we're not we are going to share screen number two so i'm going to let you guys know right now that after our first slide we're going to get right into an interview between an individual by the name of um Amir Tutsfari, who is an Israeli gentleman who's living in Israel, and uh, he's a Messianic Jew, and he's he's he goes through an interview with a man by the name of Jack Hibbs, and it's very informative, and it will really it ties in specifically to Joshua, because we're going to see the entrance into the Promised Land, and so. Does anyone remember what was happening before Joshua, before the book of Joshua? Levi, what was who was before Joshua? What big, that's right, Moses. Okay, so Moses part of the Red Sea, Big Mike. What, what, what else happened? What was significant with Moses? That's with Jesus. What's that? On Mount Sinai. Yes, Mount Sinai. So he got the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. He also uh, spoke with God mouth to mouth, right? And then we he's the one who got everyone out of Egypt. Everyone remembers that, right? There yeah, was the ten, the that's right. There was the Ten Plagues. Can you guys name two of the Ten Plagues? Locust. Yep. So we've heard darkness, locusts. What else? Uh, the the yep. Frog. Yep. Fire from heaven. Fire from heaven, yep. And then the the big one was the Passover, right? Yeah, that was with the death the of the first firstborn. firstborn. And that's where we see the Lord, the avenging angel, and we see that they keep that tradition of the Passover. So they exit Egypt, and they go into, they cross the Red Sea, and they enter into the wilderness, and God or Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, and while he's up on Mount Sinai. While he's up on Mount Sinai, sorry, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I had to look up going, something happened? <laughs> Their kids are just like banging against the walls. Um, so anyways, uh, he goes up to Mount Sinai. And while he's up on Mount Sinai, does anyone remember how um, honorable the Jews were during that time? Yeah, very good. Yeah, that golden calf thing. Right? That's right. As for this guy, Moses, we don't know what's become of him. Let's put all our gold and get, make an idol to worship, right? So that is, uh, that's when they're punished and they go to the promised land. And if you guys remember, when they get to the promised land, there was a report that went out. There was 12 people, one from each tribe that went out. And when they came back, do you guys remember the report? They were afraid. They Some were afraid because why? They saw the giants. They saw the giants, but we had two people that came back and, and said what? It was beautiful. It was good. And they Joshua they, and Joshua right. and uh, Caleb. And they brought what did they bring back with them? It was a, in, it's an international sign of commerce over there. Was it grapes or something? Yes. The grape bushel was so large that they had to carry it on the sh their shoulders hanging from their staff. That's how big the grapes were, right? What were they doing? Well, they were in their pocket, upside down. She was banging on it. She's drumming. She's drumming. So um, anyways, we see that the, the people rebelled against God. They said that God led them out in the wilderness for all their children to die. And we see God's response that he's going to uh, let them die off an entire generation while they're wandering in the desert for 40 years and that their children will inherit the promised land through Joshua. So that brings Joshua. us up to Joshua. So we're going to open up our Bible to Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, before we get into this video. So Levi would like to read, and I'm going to let him. So you've got to stand up here so everyone can hear you. you got to speak loud, clear, concise, okay? And that's all you have to read. Read the whole thing. Now, after the death of Moses, the serpent, the serpent of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke, spake under 
unto Joshua, that son of Nun Moses? No, that son of Nun, Moses' minister. Saying, Moses, my servant, is, I, is dead. Is dead now. Therefore, arise, go over the Jordan. What was the Jordan? Do you remember? Go the over river. this Jordan. That's right. So he's telling him to go over the river, right? Thou and all this people unto the Lord. Which I give, do I give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon that have I given unto as unto you as, as I said unto Moses. So in the very beginning of Joshua chapter one, we see that God speaks to Joshua saying that because Moses is dead, he you're taken over. And the way you're going to take over is you're going to cross the River Jordan and you're going to take all these people with you in this land, the promised land, is going to be yours. And everywhere that your foot touches, I've given it to you. So as you guys are aware in the news right now, lots of people are pro-Pakistan, pro uh, pro Hamas, and, and there's a lot of crazy things that are being said in the media. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, well, what's right? So I'm going to share a video with you guys today. This video is an hour and 50 minutes. So I have certain sections that I've pulled out from the video at uh, specific times where it's going to be much, much under that. But it's going to give you an explanation from a Jew who understands tentative history as well as biblical history, right? We hold our Bible as infallible. We believe that it's been given to us by God directed through the Holy Spirit, okay? There's many people who say the Bible's just a book. So what this guy does is he includes archaeological record and he includes biblical record. That way you guys can see both to really get an understanding on What's going on with Palestine, with Israel, with Iran, Iraq, Russia, and things of that sort. And also advice on a big, this is a big one for Shelly. How do we love our neighbor like the Bible tells us to do and then deal with an individual who's done what Hamas has done to the Jews? And it's the very last part of this. And it's, it, it's really well done. And I think it's important, especially with where we're at, and it will help everyone understand. So I'm going to navigate away from this page. And I'm going to go to here and share this. And can everyone see the video with the blue background? Yep. Okay. So this guy, and I'll give you guys a quick little background. I'm not going to take too much time on this. This guy's name is Jack Hibbs. He has uh, a show called Happening Now on his network, is what he calls it, where he has uh, continual meetings with people in the White House and stuff like that to get sound biblical correlations to what's going on in the world to see where we fall into this end time scenario. And he often has, you know, very prestigious guests and things of that sort. He's uh, based out of Chino, and I know about him because my cousin Christopher did his hardwood floors, and my cousin Christopher and him were dialoguing quite a bit one day while he was doing the floors, and this man said, you know, if you ever have any tough questions that you have a hard time with, I don't know if I have all the answers, but we'll work on it together, and gave him a cell phone. And so when him and I have, have questions that, are, uh, that we, we are really struggling with, on occasion— He'll shoot a text message out to this gentleman right here. And he's super busy, but he, he gets back to him, which I think is pretty cool. So he's built a relationship with this guy that you can see at the top. His name is Amir Tasf uh, Tasarfti. And this guy is, you know, full-blown Jew, but uh, believes in Jesus Christ. And so we would call that a Messianic Jew. 
That's someone who sees that Christ was the fulfillment of the Messiah and uh, embraces it. And they're, they are our brother, right? I always feel like they're better than us because they're a Jew, just like Jesus was a Jew. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and get into this video. Let me pull up my times that I have real quick. It's up in the air. Nobody can see you. All right. So let me get to, we're going to start at 11.09. Okay. Maybe so far. Yeah. Yeah. Amir, um, it is obvious too that uh, the international community understands what you just said a moment ago because of the rhetoric and of what's being said and spoken, what's being printed, the posture of nations. We see what's going on with uh, North Korea and China at a time like this. Uh, Russia, the involvement uh, in its relation, it has a, a arms or a mutual defense agreement with Iran. And so Iran is emboldened because they know that Russia's got its back. Uh, and so in light of that, we, I say we, not you, we, the United States has uh, sailed into the region and um, rather abruptly in my opinion, but I have my, my view on this, but um, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but if I remember correctly, Israel was actually not encouraging or asking for US involvement uh, no. in, into this. Israel did not ask for the Marines. They didn't ask for the SEALs. They didn't ask for these carrier two strike groups uh, to to come, did they? Israel didn't ask no. us to be there. No, I want did, everybody we, to know we, that. We did not ask for that. What we did ask is uh, uh, bunker buster uh, uh, bombs, we JDAMs, and, and for more uh, Iron Dome munitions and, and stuff like that. We did ask for our help in that area, yeah. but uh, we were actually quite surprised that uh, the White House uh, informed us that actually carriers are on their way. Um, but the talk right now is that America is in the Middle East to actually not guard Israel, but to guard the U.S. soldiers that are here in Iraq and Syria, because they, again, again what they say is that they fear that once we engage into war with the Hezbollah, um, and the rest of the Iranian proxies, America will become the target for those uh, proxies. And uh, so this is why, by the way, we're not... Okay, so this is giving you guys a little bit of background. This is the first intro introduction to this. Uh, Israel did not want the United States to show up. The, the United States is there to protect the U.S. citizens that are over there. What Israel had asked for was more... <clears throat> missiles for the Iron Dome. Is everyone familiar with what the Iron Dome is? Yeah, it's a, it's a defense mechanism. Right. So, and I, please don't quote me on this. This is way distant memory. But I want to say that 36,000 rockets are fired annually at Israel from neighboring areas. And the Iron Dome intercepts about 98% of them. And so the U.S., in support of Israel, helped put in the Iron Dome system, and we support Israel in that we help uh, supplying the ammunition for the Iron Dome to shoot the rockets that are land-based to attack Israel directly. So that'll kind of give you a background on that point. Let's go to the second one, 1656. Nor does Hezbollah, and let's be honest, according to our own government, even Iran does not have to play by the rules. Everything that is being pointed at Israel tonight, you paid for, I paid for, because generously Barack Obama shipped billions of dollars in aircraft to Iran without congressional knowledge, which is a felony. In fact, it's an act of treason. And yet, there's the net. Yet, you didn't hear anything about that. We continue to fund Iran, and we are still, and may we always fund Israel. What are we doing as a country? My concern for Israel is that they are somehow held up. But then I need to remember that God is on His throne. He knows exactly what He's doing. So one of the things that Jack Hibbs points out here is is that we're actually funding both sides of the war here. 
okay? Because Hamas is backed by Iran. And for several years, well, not during one particular administration, but during the Obama years, there was a ton of money being funneled into Iran to try and help with their economy. And as defense mechanisms, they got jets and so on and so forth. And Iran supports Hamas and Pakistan. So the, the actual items that are being used to harm Israel, we're paying for, unfortunately, or we paid for in the past. So that's that's the one item from there. Let's go to 1847. Okay. Armageddon, is this is is this a third world war? So the question is asked, is this because this is a, a lot of people ask these questions, is what we're seeing right now what end times pro, uh, uh, prophecy talks about Ezekiel 38? Is this the end of the world? Is this World War III? Is this Armageddon? Everyone knows the word Armageddon because it's been, you know, westernized and there's been movies about it. Armageddon meaning the end of the world. But if you look at the Bible in the book of Revelation, Armageddon is the battle of Megiddo. It's a specific area where this end times battle will take place. And But we have a different, ver we have a different definition intrinsically when we hear the word Armageddon because of the way that we've seen it in movies and things like that. So this is the this is from an Israeli's point of view. What's going on? Um, Amir, what can you say? I know you've been asked this by so many media yeah. outlets. What can you say to all of these questions? Uh, well, it's not the end of the world. We, we know the story. We know the end of the story. We have the book. We've read it. This is not the end. Israel is not going to be destroyed and definitely not by uh, these savages, but but uh, let me remind everyone that uh, this is the fruit of the uh, policy of this administration. I mean, Iran is flourishing right now, thanks to the lifting of the sanctions on the first week of this administration, uh, lifting of sanctions of oil sales. Uh, Iran, at the time of the previous administration, uh, went all the way down to 700,000 barrels a day, and now it's over 2 million a day. Iran's economy is recovering, yep. and Iran has billions of dollars that were uh, given to, uh, to it by this administration. And yep. everything went to continue and fortify its proxies around. Uh, this is not a new thing, but during the last administration, Iran suffered greatly, and if only the 45th would have continued, probably would have, we would have seen Iran already gone as, as far as its current regime. But we also know that God is on the throne and mm -hmm. God is in control. And the word of God predicted that um, eventually uh, the regime in Iran will not be a lover of Israel because the Ezekiel war will include Persia in the attacking coalition against Israel. So, so obviously what happens now is we are on the freeway to the Ezekiel war, but we're not there yet. That's but right. the thing is, um, there is a difficult thing for me to see, mm -hmm. and this is how the world is expecting us to abide by rules, but those rules are ridiculous. There are, there are more rules for uh, somewhere in Europe, uh, but certainly not in the Middle East. Let me, let me explain that uh, for the first hour of this invasion into through our border, we had tank commanders that did not fire a single shot. Be okay. I don't know if anyone knows this. This blew my mind when I heard this. But there are rules that have been set forth on Israel and what they can and can't do. Okay? He's going to explain some of those rules because what he's saying is Israel, it's time for Israel to start playing by the rules of the land versus what's been imposed on them uh, by others. So this this is this is what happened. Because uh, they saw hundreds or many maybe over, over a thousand of civilians that were unarmed uh, storming through the openings in the border uh, fence into Israel. And they thought we were told not to shoot any unarmed person. Not to mention that this unarmed person is the person who beheaded babies, who yes. raped women, who burned people alive, 
But again, because they did not have weapons on them, we did not shoot at them. That I mean, if, if only the, the, the command was anyone that approaches the fence, whether yes. armed or unarmed, shoot in order to kill, things would have been different. But right. we've, we have a Supreme Court that will not allow us to do that. We have a national community that will not allow us to do that. And therefore, Wait, are you describing what we saw. And all you... of that is to tell you that when an army has its hands tied behind its back, it cannot really, um, uh, you know, fight a, a, or give a good fight. I think that what happened to Israel ever since October 7 is that we have changed the hard disk to from the yeah. Europe or American mode to the Middle Eastern mode. And yep. and this is exactly why yeah. we're not. Yeah. yeah, so well said. Uh, it's amazing because it sounded like they're, uh, you, you're describing the United States. We've got a government or we've got leaders. You can't do this, you can't do that. Uh, yeah. we, we've got criminals now killing people, laughing on their way uh, to the uh, yeah. courthouse, knowing that they're going to be getting out, all of that. It's almost like it's the same kind of spirit that is just permeating yeah. uh, the world. But you know what's amazing right now, Amir, and um, we will we'll be careful with what we what we say on this. That um, where your nation has been the 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 glory of the world when it comes to security, the Israelis felt so secure with your. Uh, walls and with your electronic fences and with all of your surveillance capabilities uh, and then to have this happen uh, where now, Amir, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but this is Wednesday. And so for the last five days, the U.S. media has been saying things like this. Um, feds warn Hezbollah and Hamas may have crossed, past tense, I don't know if you guys know this, and this is public information, but it's not being broadcasted on our media outlets. So this is this is a heads up for you guys, so you guys are aware. He's Jack Hibbs is talking about our border right now. The Fed's reporting about our border. May have crossed into border states here in the United States. And what's shocking is, whoa, whoa, wait, feds are warning us about this? When every normal thinking person has been watching this happen for the last several years. And um, not to mention the fact that there are flyers and stuff found in the California and Arizona and Texas desert written in Arabic, giving them instructions to going to certain places. So what's amazing, we've got, we've got a, a, the Iranian regime believing that it's upon them to exercise their devotion to uh, Islam, that they need to destroy the, the big Satan and the little Satan. That's why we hear around the world remarkably in Argentina, death to America, death to Israel. It's amazing. In, in foreign countries, in South America, death to America, death to Israel. Where does that come from? That comes from an Islamic doctrine of protest and of belief. But the amazing thing is that, Mir, help us understand this. We're watching university campuses where people are running around waving Palestinian flags uh, saying that they uh, are for the Palestinian. I get it. I get that. But in the same breath, they're condemning Israel and leaving Hamas out of the equation completely. They're, they're condemning Israel for what Israel is doing to poor Palestinians without mentioning the word Hamas. So Amir, can you speak to us from the Middle East right now, live, where you're at, help the Western world understand what is this, what's happening, the Palestine issue, the Hamas issue, and we're just talking about the South right now. Yeah. You know, first of all, let, let me make it very clear. America is not less under attack than Israel. It's just that you haven't felt it yet. We have. But America is infilt has been infiltrated by thousands of, of these terrorists. And they don't have in mind 
any territorial dispute. It's not about territory. Right. We found a little note in one of the terrorists' uh, pockets, and we unveiled it today in front of the media. And it says there that Allah is calling them to, to uh, get rid of the enemy because the enemy is a disease without cure, and it can only be dealt by uh, beheading and the extraction of the hearts and the liver from them. Uh, that's the thinking. The thinking is, you're the problem. I mean, we're the problem. And in your case, you're the problem. By the way, death to America and death to Israel is chanted in your own universities. They will not say death to America, but they will they will say maybe death to Israel, but they will come against America as much as they come against Israel because someone indoctrinated them in those universities that we are the colonialists, we are the, the powers that everybody must fight against. But none of them, they are, they are as stupid as my shoe because they don't even know history. They don't study history. They don't have a clue that the name Palestine has absolutely nothing to do with Arabs. In fact, if you ask a Palestinian, where is Palestine come from? 99.9% .9 of them will not even know where it comes from. Okay, so Shelly, this, this section's for you. Just if you wanna, I, I, and um, you guys can still hear the video, right? Everyone's getting it loud and clear. Yes. Yeah. He's gonna he's gonna give an explanation on where Palestine comes from. This blew my mind. I wish I would have known this earlier because I would have had uh, I would have been better prepared to provide an answer for those who um, were really asking a lot of questions about this. So uh, this is this is gonna be a little bit of a history lesson now. It's funny that the very name that they are so proudly using has, is actually related to the Jewish history in the land and has nothing to do with Arabs. And so they don't know the ignorance is the best way of the enemy to use uh, use uh, them as pawns and, and 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 I call it the deception of the nations and, and the enemy. This is what he does. Uh, Satan is deceiving the nations all the time, and Israel is one of the main things that deception is about. So let me make it very clear: Hamas is an Islamic resistance movement that has nothing to do with land. It's up to, it has to do with religious fight. They are the local branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. Yes. Global uh, uh, movement that you can find them in Turkey, you can find them in, in uh, Egypt, and you can find them all around the Middle East and everywhere in the Middle East, except for Turkey, because the leader of Turkey is the leader of them. But everywhere else, uh, the Islamic Brotherhood is actually outlawed because they are very, very dangerous people. And so we're talking about a, a terrorist organization. By the way, in 2014, Benjamin Netanyahu, from the stage of the United Nations, um, uh, uh, the United Nations uh, uh, um, main uh, uh, stage there, he said Hamas is ISIS. And Obama's White House, the same day, issued an announcement saying Hamas is not ISIS. Uh, it's funny because now everybody see what Hamas is is worse than ISIS. Um, I, I I don't want to repeat what they did to us on on the fourth on the seventh of October, but we thought that we've seen it all with footage and documentaries and testimonials from Auschwitz. Auschwitz pales compares to what happened on October 7th. Yeah. A genocide took place on October 7th. And therefore, we have under the Geneva Convention, uh, under international law, we have the duty, not just the, the right, the duty to eradicate them. Now, we must understand that there has never been a Palestinian state in the history of planet Earth. Wait, wait, These wait, are say a that again. Of Arabs Amir, that say, move. Say, that, so, say it again slowly. People okay. need to know this. So, nice okay. Slow. Never in the history of planet Earth there was a nation of Palestinians and a country of the Palestinians. Never. Never. 
These Arabs are a collection of Arabs from different countries all around that predominantly most of them moved into Israel, which was called Palestine, regardless of them. I mean, the name Palestine started in 135 AD by Adrian the Caesar, who wanted to mock the Jews for rebelling against him and named the land after the Philistines, their Old Testament folk. It has nothing to do with Arabs. And, and the funny thing is the Philistines got their name from the word invader. So anyone who claimed to be a Palestinian by default actually um, it, it confesses to be an invader. But if Okay, do you guys get that? Yeah. So we've talked about how there was battles with the Philistines, you know, clear back to David, Saul, all these other kings that we had in Israel. There was a constant battle, right? Well, when Rome came into power in 135 AD, this guy Hadrian, who was the, the Caesar at the time, hated the Jews so much that he changed the name of their land from Israel to Philist Philistia to mock them because of their constant rivalry with the Philistines. From Phil Philistia, we get the word through alliteration, Palestine, because if you spell it out, you know, so that's where the that's where the title Palestine actually comes from. It's not a nation. It's because the Roman emperor Hadrian hated the Jews so much. He changed the name of their land to Philistia because the word Philistine actually means uh, invader, like what he's saying right now. And so from Philistine, we get Palestine. That's that's where it comes from. I'm gonna let, I'm not gonna interrupt him again. There's only a few more parts of this, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let this play. The funny thing is that most of the Arabs came as a result of the return of the Jews to the land. That's right. And go back to the 1984 book that was written by Joan Peters, and it's called From Time Immemorial. She's a CBS or was she passed away not long ago. CBS producer of documentaries. She was sent by the Carter administration yes. to write a book about the rights of the Palestinians over the land. Jim Carter was a great advocate of the Palestinians. And it's interesting because when she started digging into um, all the archives of the, of the Ottoman Empire, the UN and the British mandate, she was shocked to find out that most of the, the land was underpopulated in the mid 1800s, most of those Arabs came as a result of the Jewish return when the Jews brought in, 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 in a lot of wealth and industry and agriculture. And those Arabs saw good future and they moved in. So everyone that says we were there first, it was our land for that's nonsense. It's nonsense because it's not even based on facts. And again, when we talk about give them back there is no give them back they never had it to begin with the land was occupied ever since the jews were expelled the land was occupied by foreigners by the romans and the byzantines yes. and then the early muslims and then came the the, the crusaders and the late muslims yes. and then, then of course the ottoman empire for 500 years and eventually the british mandate that started in the early 1920s and the mandate that was given to Britain was that the land, that, that Palestine would be a place where the Balfour Declaration be fulfilled. And the Balfour Declaration was the promise of the British Empire for a Jewish homeland. And it's interesting because in the at the moment when the mandate was given, Palestine was actually Jordan and Israel of the day. Mm -hmm. So people don't know that. And it's interesting because none of them comes to the Jordanian and says, hey, that's Palestine as well. It's funny because Jordan controlled the West Bank until 1967, and no one asked them for a state for the Palestinians. Egypt controlled Gaza until 1967, and no one asked them for a Palestinian state. In fact, when we fought against Egypt and then signed peace with them in 1979, the Egyptians said, Give us Sinai back, but please keep Gaza to yourself. You yeah. do not want that one Isn't back. Isn't that something? Listen, that's what we have right now. People don't know that history. And uh, we have to admit that uh, lies and deceptions are all over, all around. 
and uh, we have to fight it and fighting it by knowledge and by education. And the Bible is, I think, the best source of education. Because if you go to the book of Nehemiah, to chapter 2, you see that one of those who mocked Nehemiah for returning back to Jerusalem was Geshem the Arab. And Nehemiah himself said, you will never understand why I'm back in the land and why I'm back in Jerusalem. Because you have no heritage, you have no memorial, you have no nothing in Jerusalem. You don't know Jerusalem. You don't it means nothing to you because you that's not not that's not yours. Yeah. So you will never understand why I have to go all the way back here and rebuild the city and rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple. So even the Bible tells us that the Arabs had no heritage and no so in that instance, and I'm and you guys I've I've preached this till I've been blue in the face. I won't say preach it, but I've I've shared this till I'm blue in the face about <clears throat> Daniel's prophecy about the the 69 weeks of years before the temple would be rebuilt. It was um, 173,880 days, which is when we recall that that's the distance from the time when King Artaxerxes Xerxes Longimanus on 445 BC gave the decree for Nehemiah to go back into his land and rebuild the walls and the temple. And from that day forth was when Christ presented himself on the donkey. So there is a heritage. There's people that longed for their land because it was their people. They longed to go home because they know this. They had this promise with God when others who were invaders made fun of them and mocked them. How could you possibly have such a strong tie to this, this lump of dirt? You know what I mean? And so that's going to get us into the last section here at 30. 37.55. And then this is this is the very end of it. So we'll, we'll stop here. Execute judgment upon the evildoers. Yeah, there's no doubt yeah. about the, the fact. There's all nope, that's too far. That's too far. Because that's that's the tail end of let's go to 36. We're doing a live yeah. broadcast on Facebook and WhatsApp and, and, and TikTok. They were so happy. They were so proud. They just never thought that there is a tomorrow which they will pay for. And now payday is coming. And trust me, no one in Dallas is, is that innocent. Let me tell you something. They voted Hamas in. Let me tell you that they cheer for Hamas's rockets flying to Israel every day. And I will tell you, even now, they're still completely behind Hamas. And at least half of the people that were murdered were murdered by civilians that infiltrated through the open border, not by the Hamas terrorists with guns. So we have to understand, I would not call them innocent civilians over there. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, anyone, look, the Bible tells us, people ask me, why are you so, you know, milit um, militaristic or so militant when it comes to, uh, you're a believer, you should love your enemy. Look, Romans 13 tells us that the government has the duty to use its sword against the evildoers. Yeah. And I, I'm not going and killing Palestinians. I'm not going and using anything. Did you hear that, Shelley? Yes. Romans 13, I did read, I did follow it up on, on what he was saying right there, what he was quoting, what Paul states. And it's that the government has a duty to use its sword against evil. There's a there's a parallel to that. But I expect my government, according to even the New Testament, right. to use its sword to execute judgment upon the evildoers. Yeah, there's no doubt about the, the fact that there's ultimate judgment coming at the hand of God and his righteousness. And then there is um, what I would just consider as what Amir is speaking of, um, the, the precursor to God's judgment. And that is a temporary judgments. God issues tempor temporary judgments through authorities. Uh, that's part of God's government revealed in scripture, both in Old and New Testament. Amir mentioned the word, uh, two words. He, he mentioned the word deception and he mentioned the word lies. And I'm going to, I want all of you guys to see this. Guys, we're going to go to slide number four. 
I want you to see a lie that your university student believes. And I want to unpack this for you quickly and then give Amir the opportunity to speak to this. Now, this is how the world, listen carefully, this is how the world views this current issue today. Notice the top, Palestinian loss of land, 1947 to present. That's what your kids are learning in school. That's what the UN sees. This is what many in the United States government sees. This is what many in the West see in other parts of the world. This is how they recognize it. You have friends, neighbors, family, coworkers. This is their view on the left side. This is their view. Now watch this. On the left side, Amir said it. I hope you caught it. None of that was, quote, green until 135 AD by the Emperor Hadrian, Roman Emperor. Stop right there. From the creation of time itself, all the way through, God had called this land the promised land. That it would be a land that would be eventually Abraham's land, but it eventually, the scripture says, it would be Israel. And there's a very, very direct, I'll show it to you in a moment, a very key layout of the land of promise. Okay? But from 135 AD, when Hadrian, the pagan Roman, said, I want to shame the Israelis, I want to destroy Jerusalem, so let's do this. Let's no longer call Jerusalem, Jerusalem, but Capitolina, and let's no longer call Israel, Israel, let's call it Palestine, or uh, root is Philistia, the land of the Philistines, the land of the invaders, which is today spoken, you can say, Palestine, but it comes out of Rome, friends. But from the from the unbelieving world view, to them, Israel has done nothing but eat up land. You see, the occupier to them has been advancing. That the occupier tonight is the one retaliating against those who attacked Israel. Are you tracking me? Because they view what Israel's doing as a great injustice. Why? Right? They don't believe Israel should have been in the first place. Listen, if you don't believe in the God of the Bible, then you would agree with them. This comes down not to geopolitical issues. This comes down to spiritual issues. Did God promise Abraham the land? You only know that from the Bible. You also only know this from the Bible. There is no word Palestine in the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it's not there. But Israel is in there nearly 700 times. Okay, are you listening? You can go back as far back as time can go, and you'll find the name Israel in the scriptures. Amir mentioned Nehemiah. That's about 2,500 years ago, okay? What was Nehemiah talking about? What did King Artaxerxes say to Nehemiah for him to go back and rebuild? Go back to Jerusalem, go back to Israel. Friends, the, the pagan ancient world called Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and they called Israel, Israel. No one ever called it Palestine. It was Hadrian who said, those Jews make me sick. I want to erase their memory of their land and of their heritage, so let's rename it. Let's punish them by renaming them. That name has stuck to people who do not believe in the God of the Bible. I hope this is making some sense. So what you see now to the far right is Israel present, and look how they put it. The white area now is Israeli-occupied land. And you look at that, and you're a, you're a, a, a student at, at Harvard, and you're going, oh, man, I see the injustice now. Lies and doctrines of demons. Why? Because if Israel doesn't exist, then where is Christ returning to? If there's no Jerusalem, then where is Christ going to establish his throne? Are you getting my drift? These are spiritual issues. And then real quick, I want to show you, uh, put up uh, put up number two, can guys. I, yeah. Can, can I show you uh, this, this slide that you just uh, showed? Look, this is the real deal. See, look at the screen right now. Okay, that's the fake. And that's the real. The real is that there was a British mandate yeah. 
we offer them, there was an offer for them, they said no, then 1967, then you see the rest. There was never a point where there was a Palestinian state, never a point where they owned the land, never a point where we took it from them. If anything, we offer them a state and they said, no, thank you. They said, we don't want to live next to you. We want to live instead of you. That's that's the thing that we have right now. And so in fact, what we have now, they have more than they need to. Um, and well, that's, you know, again, the, the, the fake is fake and the real is real. It's always, you always teach history from where it's convenient to you. And, and, and for them, it's convenient only from 1948. They don't want to talk about what happened before. They don't want to talk about the fact that they actually, they never had anything. And just a short reminder, we often now, since October 7th, call the Nazi Hamas. The leader of the Palestinians met with Adolf Hitler and had a pact with Hitler that once they destroyed the Jewish people, that the Palestinians will get the land and Hitler promised them that it will happen. So they collaborated with Hitler then and they are now mimicking the Nazi uh, uh, actions even today. Yep, absolutely. You guys, real quick, slide number two. Slide number two. This is the land. When God spoke to Abraham and, and told Abraham the parameters of the land, this is what it's going to be when Jesus comes back. Yeah, take a picture of that. When Christ returns and sits upon his throne, the kingdom will be established and the promised land of Israel will be fulfilled. It was really, uh, it was it was its largest under Solomon, but it was never fully realized. Friends, listen, the God of the Bible is either true or false. He's either uh, honest or he's not. When he says, this is the parameters, this is the land that is promised. Those parameters will be accomplished when Christ Jesus returns. You can, you can bet your eternal life on that. And so just, just remember that. Uh, the next slide is number three, which shows it in just more modern type colors. Take a look at that. Israel's not going to go away. Now, granted, Israel does have a tribulation period that's coming that is going to be horrific, and the Jews will suffer during the tribulation period like, like they've never suffered before. That's hard to believe, but it's that's what the Bible says. But when Christ returns, this is going to be God's kingdom. Christ sits on the throne in the millennial age, the 1,000-year reign of Christ. Um, it very much resembles slide number one. If you look at the tribes of Israel uh, from the book of Joshua, chapters 13 to 19, you can kind of see... Uh, you know, a little bit more, even though you see Simeon goes way down in, in, into the south. I just want you to visually see that. But just know this, that what you're seeing on the news today, people are screaming and yelling and tipping, burning cars and beating people up. And, um, and who knows what right now, maybe even worse things uh, because of the Palestinian issue, they're saying. Wait, is it the Palestinian issue you're concerned about? Or is it that Hamas is getting their teeth kicked in? Well, what's causing you to become violent? Why are you why are you doing this in Philadelphia? Boy, I just saw the riots in Philadelphia the other day. It was a pro-Palestinian riot. And so a group of LBGTQ went out there. Have you guys heard about this? No. no. You got so do you guys realize what Hamas does to the gays? No. They push them off buildings. The, the gays are to be executed. And so, as you're aware, the the, the predominantly pro-Palestinian people are far left-wingers. Right. The left-winger group has a, a particular following. And so when they heard that there was this pro-Palestinian, uh, um, you know, riot, so to speak, they got all their flags and made all these banners that says LBGTQ plus for Palestine. And they went out to march with these people and they kicked the crap out of them because they were gay. So um, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be funny, but this, it's just what happened. They have no idea what they're trying to support. 
they're oblivious to what's going on. And that, and he's going to shed some, a little bit of light on that. With them, with their flag, not knowing that mo- Muslims kill homosexuals. They didn't, they didn't stop to do some homework. And they got the snot beat out of them and they ran for their lives. You need to understand that the debate, people will talk about the land. So I'm going to shut it off there. It's a, I know it was a long video, guys. I just felt like it's super important for us to know the background, right? And I haven't done a really good job at articulating it. I watched that video multiple times and it's long. I encourage you guys to watch the whole thing. Um, Like I said, it's almost two hours long and it's really informative and they use good facts. They bring up scripture and it ties into what we're talking about because just like he said, you'll notice in Joshua 13 where the the tribes are ascribed their land and we've seen where the different 12 tribes uh, essentially set up their borders and their perimeters based upon what God told them to do. And we will see that all throughout the book of Joshua, which is where we've decided to read. So I'm going to get into our reading, back into Joshua. This is where we started, uh, talking about uh, the promise. Are you guys able to see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. And again, we're not, this isn't going to be a two hour long Bible study. We'll shut, we'll shut off right at eight o'clock. But so we see, God telling jo- Joshua that he's going to be the one that leads the people because Moses is dead and he's going to instruct them on how to do this stuff. And it, it's going to require them to be faithful. So Joshua one chapter four, or I'm sorry, Joshua chapter one, verse four from the wilderness and this Lebanon, Lebanon, even into the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and under the great sea to word the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all thy days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give to them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe and do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper where, where, whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of my, thy mouth, but, thy, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage and be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. God tells Joshua, don't be afraid. He's going to do things a little differently with Joshua that he did with then what the way he did it with Moses. And it's going to require some faith. And we're going to learn about these different interactions. And it's really cool. Very interesting. Uh, but this is a slide that I found about the land where we see the promised land boundaries. And you see they have some things that are highlighted up there. The desert, the Euphrates River all the way up there. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And we see where the boundaries are all the way clear down to Egypt. So like we just read about in that video, what was promised. This is where that promise come from, comes from. Okay. So verse 10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the host and command the people saying, prepare you victuals for within three days, you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to the possess the land, which the Lord, your God giveth you to possess it. And the Reubenites to the Gadites and to half the tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua saying, remember the word, which Moses, the servant of the Lord commanded you saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land, which Moses gave you on this side, Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed and all the mighty men of valor and help them until the Lord hath given your brethren rest and he has given you and all they have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. 
Then you shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side, Jordan, toward the sun rising. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. According as we hearken unto Moses in all things, so we will hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that doeth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearken unto thy words, and all thou that you have commanded him, he shall be put to death, only be strong and of good courage. So if you guys think back way into our distant study of uh, numbers, you'll remember that Moses had come to a certain spot in the land before the Jordan, the edge of the promised land. Because remember, he was he was not allowed to go into the promised land. He died. Okay, And the Reubenites were outside and they were like, man, this is the perfect land for the cattle. And Moses is like, absolutely not. You need to go to battle. God has promised us this special land. And they tell him, we're not saying we won't go to ba battle, but please ask of God if we can have this land and we'll make sure all of our men go with you to battle. That way, nobody loses heart and we all fight together as a full group. And Moses said, okay, we'll permit that as long as that happens. Joshua was holding them uh, accountable to it. So we see the people's response. Absolutely. We're ready to fight with you as long as God is with you. And anyone who doesn't fight you, fight with you, we're going to put to death. And uh, that gets us into chapter two. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out to Shittim to men, two men to spy secretly, saying, go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are coming to thee, which are entered into thine house. For they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, They came, there came men into my house, or unto me, but I would I did not know where they came, where they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I don't know. Pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of her house and hid them with stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon them up to the roof of the house. Oh, I'm sorry. Which she had laid in order upon them upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way of the Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they that which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard of how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when we came out of Egypt or when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did they remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. We're going to stop there. So. We're, next week we're gonna we're gonna talk about Rahab the harlot, and we're going to just start reading about how Joshua goes into Jericho and and all these cool battles and what it means for history, uh, you know, clear through the lineage of Christ and things like that. Um, but it was very interesting to read that what Rahab says is that these people are in other lands, and they heard about the Red Sea parting, and so when they see. These Jews, well, not Jews yet, but these um, Israelites, Israelites. Thank you, Miguel. Outside of the Jordan, which is another big river that's separating their army from their their land, they're terrified, right? And good reason to be because we know that our God parts seas, right? So on that note, we'll stop there, and uh, I'm going to stop the recording in case anyone has any questions. Let's see if I.